Um, as Kevin mentioned earlier, if you have a question that you see in the chat, give it a thumbs up. You say, oh, I like that question. Give it a thumbs up or a heart or some kind of emoji so we know we need to bump that question to the top. Otherwise, um, please use the Q&A to put your questions in the Q&A Q section. This is being recorded, so you're going to get the slides and the video replay within 48 hours. And now I would like to turn it over to our speakers from Roundtable, Josh and Amy. Take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rita. Great. Um, so hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, our artificial intelligence uh, Ask the Experts. Uh, I, I always cringe a little at the word expert. I don't really consider myself an expert in anything, um, but always learning and learning with everybody. And um, that's just part of my job. But that said, I have been doing a ton of work in AI, using AI, teaching AI, <laughs> learning AI uh, over the last uh, couple of years. And very happy to share what what things I can today and also learn from everybody here, including my wonderful colleague, Kim Snyder. Um, so Kim. Hi, I'm Kim Snyder, VP of Data Strategy at Roundtable Technology. And um, my other hat that I wear, just because we're at the ethics uh, and principles and governance uh, session today, is data and data privacy and data governance. And I've been doing a bunch of that with uh, nonprofits for, actually Josh and I have been working together with nonprofits for about 30 years. So um very uh and also we've been very very focused on ai and some of these implications and as i was telling the group before the session um i'm so i love the questions that have been coming in so looking forward um yeah initially ai has kind of been more or less in the news for about 30 years i'm wondering if anyone it's like 27 years ago was probably the first big ai story I um, wonder if anyone knows what that is or would want to put it in, but the first time AI became meaningfully better than humans at something that humans cared about. Um, that's my, that's your hint. You know, as a guess at that, about 27 years ago. Um, all right, we'll just let that sit. We'll see if anyone in the chat grabs that one. All right, so Kim, I'll let you uh, take it from here. Yeah, I will turn this off. So we're going to give you, um, uh, we're going to give you, today's our welcome and introduction. Um, we're going to talk briefly. We've got a couple slides here. Um, they're going to introduce themes that I think we're going to be coming back to um, over and over in this discussion. Um, we're actually starting, got to reverse this a little. We're going to actually start with your questions. So start, start mulling them over. And then we're going to save time for submitted questions at the end. So let's go forth. Um, All right. And everybody uh, correct, uh, folks have said Deep Blue uh, beating Kasparov in chess. Uh, that is correct. And then uh, 27 years later, Microsoft actually just overtook Apple as the most valuable company in the world. And another trivia question people can put in the chat is, uh, well, what country's gross domestic product is closest to Microsoft's? <laughs> right now, right now. True to flow. So AI ethics I principles and um, all right. Uh, heading heading into our session. Um, See, we need to so, mute Roy. We're getting uh, feedback from Roy's. Um, there we go. Go ahead, Kim. Thank you. All righty. So we are going to hop right into ethics principles and governance, and this is an important session to have. Um, and so on the next slide, I like to start these by level setting a little bit. First of all, AI means a lot of things, okay? So we can be talking sophisticated systems that people are building or, you know, people are using and, and kind of, um, you know, designed. We can be talking about uh, software that has AI included in it. We can also be talking about the thing that's gotten AI kind of in the headlines a lot lately, which is generative AI. OK, so I just want to acknowledge that there is a, a, a continuum around AI. And I also want to say that there is um, the journey of adoption for a nonprofit um, is also a continuum. So I just wanted to put that out there. And I'm not sure where everyone who's here is on the journey, but suffice it to say, even at the very beginning stages of initial exploration and experimentation, which I suspect 
think a lot of organizations are now. Um, I, my, I, I believe that the, the principles we're going to be talking about today are key to what you need to be thinking about even at the very beginning. They don't just apply only if you're deep into some kind of machine learning. Okay, so I just wanted to put that out there. So when we talk about, I think we can go forward and, and I, I believe everyone will get these slides. Um, and um, okay, just wanna make sure, okay, uh, everyone can hear me okay? I just saw something about the microphone. All right, so when you think about ethics principles, right? Um, these are these kind of the baseline principles around fairness, transparency, maintaining privacy, and also just general ability as an organization. These are the kinds of principles that you'll see in something like the AI Bill of Rights that came out. I believe that was in 2022, early in the year. And so we're seeing, so these, when we think about AI ethics, these are some of the big stories, right? When we apply this to generative AI, and I suspect that that's where most of the people who are attending are, right? Earlier in the continuum, a little bit, the adoption continuum, and trying out maybe some of these tools or wondering if your organization should try out some of these tools. So when we think about how do we, you know, how do these kinds of principles apply if we're thinking about generative AI, right? They've come up around, people ask a lot of questions around authenticity, copyright, the potential to generate at scale kind of misinformation and manipulate others with like deep fake videos, things like that. Um, there's a lot in the news. Um, it keeps kind of coming up and down. It's a very unsettled area is around copyright and intellectual property. And also one of the things to think about and people have asked questions about all of these things, but one of the things to think about is like, how will this affect our workplace? How are we gonna deal with this new thing? What are we gonna do? So um, I think we moving on, I'm just gonna, on a high level, talk about what some of the general risk categories are, right? So when people, a lot of people heard like, it, it's been in the headlines and headlines like drama. So we've heard a lot, and even the, some of the AI community people like a lot of drama, to be honest. Um, so thinking about the risks, and I'm thinking here, I'm focusing more on generative AI, but think about the risks for a nonprofit that's starting to put this to use. One of the key risks, and I'd say one of the biggest and thing that will happen the most often and you need to be mindful of, and luckily there's a way to stop this from getting in your way, but what's called known as confabulation, right? And that's basically not saying inaccurate things, right? It makes things up. Important thing to remember about AI, and we don't have time to get into this whole thing now, but I'll give it to you in a couple of sentences. AI, there's, even though intelligence is in the, in the name, there isn't like intelligence in there. There's no like thing that like reasons, right? This is a probabilistic tool, right? So it's statistics guiding this. So sometimes it generates stuff that's incorrect, but sounds really correct, okay? Um, another issue, and I know this is on the minds of a lot of people, is around bias, right? And a lot of these generative systems that we use today are built on today's data. Today's data has a lot of bias, okay? The people who made the tools are themselves from a certain demographic group. Um, Dr. Joy Bulamwini, who wrote Unmasking AI, has uses a term, pale male data. Because a lot of the people creating these tools, especially in the early days, have been guys, right? Like guys. So yes, there is bias. There's also um, issues around privacy. Here we're thinking more from the generative AI about what you're putting into your prompts, right? What, what, how much data do you want? You know, are you putting in there? And you don't want to use it for personal information unless you know that your data is not being used for training and it's kind of staying within your enterprise. Some of the newer tools, such as Microsoft Copilot and things like that, that organizations are getting, have that capability of kind of keeping within the walls of your organization. And finally, copyright. And, and for this, I would say a general rule is not to ask it to write me some, something in the style of, and then some author's name, 
or as well, don't asking for an image like in the style of a specific artist or even a New York cartoon, for example, is you can start to tread on the line of copyright there. So I think that's it for, I think I turn it over now to you, Josh. And the team is, yeah, they're putting in some great resources around um, Microsoft and this is sponsored by Microsoft. So stuff around copyrights because they, they have specific um, policies around that. I can't hear you. I turned off my microphone because I was making noise, I think. Um, the answer to the trivia question, in case anyone hasn't figured it out yet, is, is uh, Microsoft's uh, current market capitalization, let's see if I can do a switch, um, is about $3 trillion, uh, as of today. And uh, France, it's actually just overtaken France. Microsoft has overtaken the gross domestic product of France in terms of its uh, value and market capitalization. So there you go. So Microsoft is a France in terms of economic output at this point. Anyway, um, so that's uh, the answer. Or two tri I'll, I'll see if I can come up with some more trivia questions. So around guiding principles of, of using AI within the nonprofit space is, first of all, I want to Say a couple of things that are on the slide, which is I think there's a really significant risk, and I would even argue um, an ethical obligation for nonprofits to uh, think about how they will use AI and how they will teach their staff to use AI. Um, one of the reasons why uh, Microsoft has overtaken Apple is because so many people believe they have a significant head start on AI investment, and it is believed that by many people that AI will play a very significant role in the workplace and economy. And so if we are not teaching our staff and our personnel um, the, how to use these tools and use them safely and responsibly and ethically, and also leveraging these tools to fulfill our missions, to further our missions and provide better, more um, different services to the kinds of communities that we're serving, um, then I actually think you're missing a tremendous opportunity. Uh, and of course, with any opportunity comes risk, and that's largely what we're focusing on today. But I, I really want to underscore the idea that I, I do, I personally think there's an ethical ob um, obligation to use these tools, both to benefit from them and also to be a part of this conversation around ethical and safe use. So get off that soapbox. Guiding principles. First of all, understand that your staff are probably using AI tools already. If you like most organizations, if you haven't introduced any AI policy, haven't introduced any AI training, it's not like people don't have access to these tools for free or for very low cost. And many of your staff will probably figure out, hey, I can use this to like write emails, write documents, create reports, maybe even analyze data, create images. And if you're not providing them with some policy about, hey, this is the right way to use it, this is not a good way to use it, this is the tool we'd prefer you use, this is the tool, then you're courting tremendous amounts of risk as well as um, potential uh, harms to uh, both your staff and to the communities that you may serve and to others. So make sure that you're thinking about how AI can align with your organization, where it fits in, right? Understand that people are concerned that, that this may impact their jobs, that they may lose their jobs, address those concerns, think about how that will play out at your organization. and provide guidelines on how we want you to use it and how we don't want you to use it and, and where you can go wrong. Kim, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, just that we do have a template we're happy to share um, with organizations. Um, Got to start somewhere. You don't need to have the AI acceptable use policy to end all AI acceptable use policies. In fact, you will be continuously revisiting it because it keeps changing. And so let's look at, at use cases, all right? So very simple risk benefit matrix that we're kind of looking at here. So on the vertical axis, we have benefit. How useful is this? On the horizontal axis, we have risk. So let's look at something like, I need to create images for blog posts on a regular basis. I need these images to be original. I need them to be kind of catchy, you know, do things. Um, if I can, create these images using a generative AI tool like Dolly or Midjourney, 
and with a minimal amount of training, make sure that we're creating images that are appropriate and ethical and not copyright violations and not asking for image, you know, images that look like Banksy paintings, right? I'm, I'm, I'm doing that. This is a relatively low risk, potentially high benefit use of AI, right? Um, down in the lower right, where we add a lot of risk, okay, is let's say a chat bot that we put on our website for at-risk youth, because that's who we serve, um, to get uh, access to, you know, uh, health questions and safety questions and things like that. And we think, you know, our volunteer line is overloaded. Whoops, we're getting some noise from somewhere. Our volunteer line is overloaded with, with calls. We can't answer them all, so let's put a chat bot up on the site. That has a tremendous amount of risk in terms of the kinds of outcomes that could happen. We could point you to lots of different stories around this. So focus at first, right, on the areas where you have high benefit, low risk things that you can leverage AI to do, right? When you start exposing large amounts of sensitive information of your organization to the AI, right, in order to um, get results that you want, you're increasing risk, potentially increasing benefit, right? But increasing risk. So that's when you're further down the maturity continuum. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's that's kind of all we had. It's a very, it was intended to be a very short presentation, right around 15 minutes. We managed to hit it just a minute over, which really isn't bad. All right. Um, and there's a guide to AI policy usage and we have the acceptable use policy link in there. And at this point, I think we are ready for questions and we're gonna before we go to our submitted questions i think we wanted to go to live questions yep currently there are any live questions yet so you can go to the submitted questions and we'll catch you up if there's any submitted live questions okay all righty i think um, folks can raise their hand too if they just want to ask one and come off mute we'd certainly welcome that yeah, I have the uh, pre-submitted questions. If you want me to start with just one of those, and if at any point somebody again, you can take yourself off a of mute and jump in. Uh, first question I, I have here is, how can we know if a large language model was trained ethically? Also, how can we find out what the environmental impacts of a particular generative AI tool are? Kim, you want to take that first? Or you want me to take a crack at it? Okay. Well, I, I I will I will take a crack at it first. So, how do we know if it's created ethically? So, one of the things we're separating here is so the for the most part, the large language models are going to be created by another company, right? Like Microsoft or OpenAI. Um, so I think it's important to kind of look at the policies, and I believe um, we've got some from Microsoft around ethical AI development, and they partner with OpenAI. So I'd say that looking at the um, the materials that are provided by these by the companies that you're seeking to work with are going to be the key thing. Um, the environmental usage, that that's that's a hard call. Yes, it does consume a lot of resources. Um, I don't know that, I, I think that there's going to be more attention to that. And again, I think this comes down to a specific type of um, application or actually reaching out to the vendors themselves and looking at their policies. Um, this is an area, though, that people are concerned about. I don't know, Josh, if you would add something to that. We can't hear you. All right, yeah, I keep turning off because I'm making noise. Um, one of the first things I do with some of these questions, especially when I'm not particularly confident myself, is go to a large language model and ask the question. And, and that gives me a starting place to kind of think about the issues. Uh, fundamentally, I think under that question around um, trained ethically, first, we have to define what that ethically means to you. Does that mean uh, wasn't trained on copyrighted data without permission of copyright holders, um, was trained thoughtfully in the sense of looking at the data sets and ensuring that they were representative of wide groups of people, um, we didn't steal data or scrape data that we weren't giving consent to, like what does the ethically mean to you? Um, that part's probably the easier part, is determining what the ethical bar is for you on what 
an ethically trained system would constitute. I think the hard part is going to be then mapping that and finding out with any confidence whether systems in the world uh, reach that ethical bar that you've then set. Um, I think you can try, and I think that there will increasingly be more transparency because consumers and companies will demand it. But right now, I think you have a very uphill climb trying to establish um, exactly how, because it's very closely held and generally opaque as to how these models were trained. And they're they're only getting more so because of all the legal action that's being taken. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a challenging one. Yeah, I'd say stay tuned to there's going to be a lot of copyright lawyers doing a lot of work over these next the next decade, because this is a very new and unsettled area. Yeah, and I feel like there was a second part to that question, Kevin, what was the or a second question that you asked there? Environmental impact, the environmental impact, oh, environmental impact. Um, most of them, it's pretty significant because they're they're using up tremendous amounts of energy. Um, and so if you, that's mostly what it is. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there aren't other significant environmental impacts other than they are massive energy consumers right now. Um, that will probably get better um, as we continue to improve computing power and also um, increase the ability of these tools to per perform at a very high level uh, with less data and compute. But right now they are, massive energy hogs. Thanks. There's a question though that did come in through the chat and I wanted to swing back to that. Um, Robin asked, what AI tools are you recommending? Um, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll start off with that. Um, so uh, well, we want to acknowledge the sponsors, right? So Microsoft, Microsoft actually was the group that put um, Kind of co pilot at the time it was Bing. Josh and I taught a course all about the different uses um, around um, Bing, and um, Bing combined uh, GPT 4, which is the highest level, um, you know, large language model, the open AI, because it's a partnership, and also DALI, DALI 3. So you can make images and uh, text and nice documents and look things up, and it, it with the web. So that is was one of the real benefits to that. There are other tools, ChatGPT, one of them. I would recommend also looking at GPT plus, right? Because you get some extra features there. Um, but if you've not tried any tool, I would definitely try some of these, some of the free tools. And um, any other advice on that, Josh? Well, I think one of the things I definitely want to share is that um, one of the things about uh, Microsoft uh, on this, and let me get my right image up, there we go, um, is that if, you're, if your organization is using Microsoft 365 um, and you, is everybody seeing the Copilot, your everyday uh, companion yeah. on my screen? Did I get the right, yeah. right? You'll see this big protected here. Um, and if you follow this through, what it is in essence telling you is that if you're using a, it's the free version of Copilot, but it's the free version that's included with a paid Microsoft 365 subscription, okay, which is E3 or E5 or business standard or business premium. And if you have one of those, then your data is protected and you can not only use Copilot for free, but um, you can share information with it. You can you don't have to worry because if it's was already in OneDrive or SharePoint, you're not exposing it to anything further um, by putting it in Bing Chat if it's protected. You do have to make sure that you do have that big green protected. And that's a big plus on the Microsoft side. But the other tools just are not providing it. But I also encourage people to try tools, right? So try them out. Um, I know I use different tools for different types of needs, right? For different types of use cases. And again, some of that's about finding your own style. That actually, actually I don't want to jump into all of that because we actually have another ask the experts on that in a little bit at the end of the month. So next question. And the nice thing about the tools is that while they're all different and they all have like perplexity, which Deb is, and, and Deb does a lot of AI, if that's the Deb I'm thinking of, 
Um, Deb knows a lot about these AI tools, uses a lot of different ones. So if she's saying she likes perplexity, that's definitely meaningful. Um, you know, the, they all work in similar ways. They're all going to respond similarly to good prompts and respond similarly, you know, poorly to poor prompts. So by building skills in one, in terms of the kinds of things that these tools are good at right now and how to get the best outputs from them, uh, those skills will typically carry across from platform to platform. To follow up on that, this is a, would be a really good question, so I'm going to kind of bump this one up a little bit, is how do I know that the answer or text generated by the AI is factually correct? Mm. <laughs> you don't I have to verify. That's an easy one to answer. Yeah, and that, that is one of the big takeaways that I hope people have from here. Not so much to be afraid to use these tools because they may say something incorrect, you know, like that un rather unfortunate lawyer back last summer. Um, but that there is an onus on us as using as users of these tools, responsible use, to verify the things that come out of it. So I tend to not ask it things that I don't know already or don't have any way of verification. Especially I'm gonna share it widely. And also, it speaks to the importance of reviewing the stuff that comes out, which can be part of your AI policy. That's a great point. It almost it's like it, it it's a, the beginning of the process, not the beginning and end of it, right? And that's kind of what it feels like when you're using an AI tool. I want to jump back into chat because another mm -hmm. good question came in from Aaron. If an AI system causes harm to someone, what are your thoughts on mechanisms for redress? Are there certain policies you recommend to help these individuals? So in the EU, which tends to be out in front on these kinds of issues um, around data privacy and around transparency, I forget what they call it, but they have a right for human review has been established um, in the EU around uh, AI systems. So if I'm applying for a mortgage, applying for a loan, applying for a job, and the decision as to whether I'm granted an interview, given a mortgage, given a loan, was algorithmically determined through an AI system, then I have a right to ask for a human review of that process. I think that's a pretty good standard that an organization could establish um, if they wanted to redress a particular harm that was done through an AI system, is basically give anyone who who thinks they were unfairly treated by a system that you're using has an option for a human review. So that's my kind of quick answer. I don't know, Kim, if you interested, if the person who asked that has more specifics about the kinds of harm they're thinking of there. I mean, some of the harms you want to avoid, right? So like the harm, the chatbot that, that Josh gave as an example in the high risk category. So I think more like as an organization that's, you know, wanting to, to to make use of these kinds of AI tools because it can, it can reach a larger audience 24 seven, et cetera. But if those tools haven't been adequately tested, rigorously tested on an ongoing basis, it has, it has a distinct possibility of spewing out information that's not correct. So you want to, you know, as do your due diligence, right, and testing. Um, and, and again, think of that risk benefit. Right? Is the risk worth the benefit, right? Those kinds of questions. But um, yeah, I think, I mean, in terms of AI harms, um, and just to note what Josh was saying about the EU, we are starting to see, albeit in groups in tiny drabs, right, in uh, privacy legislation that's coming up to the fore in various um, US states the inclusion of that type of right to, you know, kind of for human review around AI and decision making. So that's, you know, but again, one of the reasons why Joshua and I have felt so strongly and have continued to be working with nonprofits to help nonprofit organizations to use these tools and to feel comfortable using them and speaking about them 
is because we need more human-centered people asking these sorts of questions. The more people that are asking these questions about the tools that you are purchasing or using, the better, you know, better it is for everybody. So there's not pasting in the chat. Go ahead, Kevin. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, um, this is a statement, but I think it could be reworded as a question. But go ahead, Josh. Um, I was just going to say I dropped something in the chat around like another way to mitigate harm, which is a bit lazy, but required is just just putting disclaimers around AI systems that people may interact with. So if you're going to put a chat on your site, something that says, hey, this might display inaccurate info, please double check it, <laughs> its responses, um, and then have something to click further on that. So um, and, and most systems are now adding that. Right. So so to that, like um, what Christian had stated about with around confidence level um, and I had tossed into the chat like and you had mentioned a disclaimer and some models will specifically state through which point they're referencing. But um, is there anything else that either of you can think of um, as, as it relates to confidence, like maybe querying back to the model itself, even asking with what rate of confidence? You know, are, is this answer been generated or um, a way to to pull out maybe some additional information, like even around the, the sources that it reference it's referencing? The the challenge around that with the way and, you know, a, a person who's built large language models and understands this better than me would probably have a better take on it. One of the challenges is that everything you ask it, remember, is another probabilistic response. So, so what these large language models are doing is probabilistically um, looking at words and saying, what is the most likely next word based on the context of this conversation? Not what is the most accurate word in the context of the conversation or what is a factual word in this conversation? So by asking it, you can improve sometimes by asking for confidence levels, asking to cite sources, saying, make sure these sources really exist. But in my experience, they will still confabulate on you. I do not have an answer other than you have to manually, right, just validate things, especially if they're really critical facts or you don't know that they're true. Um, because asking the large language model is creating this circular feedback loop that is not going to help you. I think here's here's the thing I want to kind of point out. Um, First of all, because a lot of the questions I'm hearing right now are this kind of question is more about like search and how do I know the search result I'm getting is is correct, right? AI systems, large language models are not search. I realize that um, Copilot um, and Bing are actually allow you to do both. But if we can kind of go more into the realm of the large language model for just right now, they are they are ideal for things and again this speaks to what are the use cases that we're putting it to work in right please summarize this publicly available 75 page report and pull highlights from it right that i can verify i can actually look and cite page numbers so that's a type of task or please correct the grammatical errors in this you know five page you know, article I've written. Okay, so those are kinds of use cases where it's the fact that it's a probabilistic model, so it's doing math really, is not going to get in my way too much, okay? Or I've definitely a way to kind of counteract it. Again, think low risk, high benefit, right? Turn this, you know, five paragraphs into three bullet point slides is a great use of AI and help save me a lot of time. And there are countless use cases like that. And I think that's what the task for organizations to do as they start to think about adopting AI um, is what are the things we can put it to use doing, right? That's part of the journey. Uh, so Shaista um, had asked, um, about providing uh, a list of uh, influential papers or articles on AI that could be recommended for the group. Uh, this is not, academia is not my area, so um, I leave it to two of you. If you have anything you could add to that. 
I'm going to I'm going to plop a couple in that just leap to mind. Uh, there'll be two that, that are apps. I would put as absolute kind of must is one actually a Microsoft report. Um, so let me send those. Um, so and um, Deb, if you're the Deb who I think you are, um, if you want to drop in your newsletters to follow um, the, the Substack article that you wrote on that, I think that might be a good resource for uh, Shaista as well. Um, if I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing your name well. Um, and uh, so the two that I dropped in, one is not exactly a research paper, but um, uh, yeah, Deb dropped in that same newsletter. So the reshaping uh, the tree, rebuilding organizations for AI, I think is a must read for, for nonprofits around um, the kind of current state of AI and how things are changing. And then the AI and productivity report first edition for Microsoft. I think some of the early data around how AI is impacting knowledge workers, which are probably most of us, uh, is is pretty incredible. And if it holds up, is I think underscores how potentially transformative this can be for the workplace um, in ways that are really largely positive. That are people are getting better uh, performance with less stress which is kind of the magic uh, ingredient. And it also appears to level up people to a consistently high level. So if you have like D, C, B, A performers, your A performers move to A plus performers, but all the other performers become B plus, A minus for performers, which is, if that holds up uh, or, or you know is replicated, that's pretty incredible. Um, Kim's dropping a bunch of other good ones in there. I'm sure other folks in the, We'll drop plenty in there for you, Shady stuff. Um, but that's uh, those are my two that I would for sure start with. Uh, so Janice had asked um, about um, giving more examples um, of possible uses, use cases, uh, use cases of AI in in the workplace. I'm I'm assuming is what uh, Janice is implying. Sure, Kim, you want to start on that one? You want me to? I mean, think about tasks again, think it through risk benefit. So the great use cases that we have all the time are create an RFP or think about tasks that you have to do that are like, oh, right, where it'd be really helpful to have something else. If you had a magic intern, and often we kind of think about AI tools as a magical intern that never gets tired and always will do stuff. Can you please write me a first draft? of an RFP for X, Y, and Z thing that I need. Can you please um, summer, you know, put, pull together these two paragraphs? So kind of copy editing types of writing, um, job descriptions, it does a great job with. Um, I mean, Josh, it, the list is kind of endless and it really depends on the types of needs that you have, but those are some of the things that come immediately to mind for me tasks that take people a long time, but um, a good first draft is really helpful. I mean, if we want, I could run through the kind of some of the DoFest slides that we did earlier this week, Kim, that kind of just, so Janice, I can run through a bunch of use cases all at once and, and maybe I'll do that in a minute, but I wanna say something fundamental first. What I've come to realize about these tools is that if I, fundamental way to think about use cases is this, if I need to do something, write an email, write a report, analyze some data, clean up a spreadsheet, create a couple of images, find a couple of images, write a blog post, blah, 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 a, a task, write a report, um, create some data visualizations. As you learn these tools and understand their capabilities, and when you're using them regularly and understand how these capabilities are changing, then as you come upon doing something, I can ask, is it worth making a thing to do this thing? rather than doing the thing myself. <laughs> so I can create, for example, a custom GPT, which is like a little chatbot, to do data analysis for me, to create data visualizations for me, to write an RF write RFPs for me. So if I need to write an RFP, I could take the next two hours to try to write an RFP, or I can take the first 30 minutes of those next two hours and try to create a prompt or create a little GPT that writes RFPs in the way that I want and then have it do that. And instead of at two hours, I have an RFP draft that I've spent a bunch of mental energy writing 
in 45 minutes, I not only have a draft that's probably as good or better than that first draft that took me two hours, but I actually have a repeatable, like a tool that does this for me that I can improve on. And yes, I still have to go take this draft and make sure it's good and go clean up everything. But what I have found very true for me and Kim, I think would say the same is this data that shows that people are more productive and less stressed is because of that. Because for me, spending the two hours writing the RFP is very taxing. It's cognitively you know, uh, demanding. But creating a little chatbot to create RFPs and then having it create the RFP and then going doing that is is both more fun and also gets me to a better product with less of my own energy and time, frankly. So that's the fundamental thing. So let me now go quickly share, um, I think, where you want this one. So let me just walk you through just to be more. Um, so this was from a presentation that Kim and Deb and I did, actually. Are we, Pardon, Kim? Are you showing the whole, okay the presentation? All right. Yeah, I'm just gonna skim through it. So like, so you know, we can create text cutting obviously of all kinds. Pardon, Kim? I think it's cutting off for some reason. Oh, that's too bad. Um, let's see. Let me stop. Let now me we will be again. having. Now we will be having a. Um, and actual ask the experts on prompt writing specifically. So I, I encourage people to come back for that one, um, where we'll be walking through some of these things more and talking about how you write prompts. I mean, one of the things that we kind of envision, Josh was talking about GPTs, but even if we don't have that, to organizations will start to develop prompt libraries for themselves, ideally, that they can share um from between departments between different employees okay so he's just kind of going through stuff you can do yeah if you want to talk through him kim or i can i just was going to oh, go through them all quickly okay. i mean yeah no, we should so that's yeah we can go through that one you can skip that one all right you can do slides and presentations and now copilot is um in powerpoint so that's another thing you can do. We did make some images. Um, we can do I'm not some- I'm gonna play the video, but this is me translated into six different languages, speaking what appears to be fluently, six different languages. Okay, so- Meeting summaries, which AI is very good at. I'm sure everybody sees the little AI note takers that are in all your meetings these days. Um, and uh, I think the rest was covered. Yeah, so those were, and then when we got to the end, this was sort of our list of things that we offered to do. So we've been doing these do fests where we take an hour and just take requests to actually do work for people and we do it in real time using different AI tools. So these are the kinds of things we offer to people. Obviously there's much more than that, um, Janice, but hopefully that gives you a, a kind of flavor of it. It's a lot. Okay, so um, let's get to some of the, uh, Submitted questions, actually. Um, so I'm just taking a look at these. Um, now there, we did get a lot of questions about prompting. Um, and so some people say my biggest challenge is that I've never really used AI before. What do I do, right? And we were saying earlier, there are a number of free tools. Try them out, but in kind of very low risk situations. Start to, you know, uh, I was in another presentation and we talked about dedicating some time, like a part of like an hour on a Friday every week to try out these tools and get to know your own personal style. Because you can't, here's the, here's the thing about AI and AI tools is that it's not a technology task as much as it's a question writing task. Sometimes AI for me has been a great thought partner, if you will, because it's helped me think through the question I'm asking, right? I can, so go through that process and get to know your own style, right? Before you roll out AI in an organization-wide level, that's when you really wanna think about, do we have a policy? Are we gonna put a policy in place? Things like that. But I think individually to just to get to know, even to do personal things, try it out, so. And, and one one last comment on this is just I really 
encourage you to 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 accept that some things won't work understand that they won't work and that that's just part of learning and if you go to use an ai you use copilot you use ChatGPT, you use bing you use something else to do something and it doesn't work right um and that was the first time you, and you're like oh this ai thing's terrible right understand very clearly okay that 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 was the moment that you were the worst at using ai because you were just starting to use it and that's the worst ai you'll ever use because every ai from that day forward is going to be better than the one that you just used um and so I, I I try things all the time that don't work. I spend a half an hour trying to get an AI to do something and then say, it's just not gonna happen, it just happened yesterday. But so many things do work and some of them do things that I could never have done without AI, so. A couple of my friends, for example, have asked me, I've got this really, again, when early in the early days learning AI, here's a great use case. Ask your friends if they have any gnarly emails that they don't feel like writing. Like, oh, I have to write to my landlord because our super is smoking in the basement. You know, like, and it can craft a, an, e you know, an email for you. You can ask it to change its tone. Please sound friendly, but, but firm, right? So you can try things like that. Um, so, uh, and, and sometimes people will want to know, where can I get trained? Where can I learn all of this? Well, we do have classes in, you know, uh, TechSoup is a great place. Um, but I think trying it out, like uh, getting wet and jumping in the pool. Um, can I tell a quick, can I ask you a quick story, Kim? I just sure. want to, um, so this is the, the college admission. So I'll give everybody an example as well. So my wife, um, my son's 16. She's, you know, furiously trying to figure out how to help him get into college. This is an example of use. And uh, while I'm making breakfast for the kids, um, like seven o'clock yesterday morning, she says, I, I'd like your help doing something with AI. I'd like a slide deck to kind of explain these two books that I've been reading to my son, to our son about college. And I said, okay, um, I've got to cook breakfast, but let me talk you through it. So I put her in front of, um, you know, my co-pilot account. I talk her through a prompt. Uh, we use that prompt to create an outline for a slide deck. We drop that outline into Copilot to have it generate a presentation. Um, and uh, let's see if I have that up. Um, doo -doo -doo. Hang on, I have to get the slide deck up, of course. Uh, why am I not seeing this thing? Hang on, bear with me a moment. Try one more time here. Let's see if it'll allow me to share this. All right, I just have to do the entire screen. Okay. All right. And within about 10 minutes, uh, we had this slide deck based on these two books. And I never even touched the computer. I just talked her through doing all this while I was cooking breakfast for the kids. Um, in, uh, and this was about 10 minutes of work. So this is an example of the kind of thing that, anyway. Um, righty, so uh, let me see, I was just looking at these questions. Um, bup, 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 bup. I think we've gone through a lot of them around reliable information. I think we can stop sharing, I'm seeing myself. Um, are you gonna share more on your screen, Josh? No, I'm good. Oh, okay, am I still you, sharing? I'm, I yeah. thought I'd stopped. I'm sorry. My bad. Um, all righty. Uh, but, 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 but I think people know it's verify, and we can't know the types of errors that it's going to make. Um, you know, when's it safe? There is one article I will put in here if I haven't already. Um, Harvard Business Review, and that's where we got that matrix, the risk benefit from. Um, Harvard Business Review talked about this in the early days of AI being available. Like, oh my goodness, what are people going to use this for, right? And helping organizations to find their use cases. That is kind of one of the tasks that needs to be done, right? Is in your organization figuring out what are we, you know, how do we want to use this tool? Um, I do encourage people that are thinking about how would we roll this out at our organization or in our department 
to really talk to stakeholders to get to know what are those kinds of time consuming tasks that they'd love a first draft for and then vet those. Um, and I realized that another question, I don't, I'm not seeing it right now, but one of the concerns that comes up often when I talk to people and nonprofits about um, AI is what about people and their sense of is my job, is, is, is this a, what about the future of my job, right? And there are a couple different ways to look at that. Number one, think of AI not as a tool to replace humans, but as a tool that augments the work we do. That's a very different mindset. It's not like we all have lots and lots of spare time in our workday, right? So that if I can save some time writing a first draft so that I can spend more time writing a higher quality draft so that it sounds, so that it is more authentically me and sounds more like me, that's a better use of my time. And I'm like, cut some of it in half, right? So it's, and talk to stakeholders um, in your organization about the kinds of work they do and, and thinking about ways that you could leverage this type of capability to help that. Humans need to be very much part of this, all right? There's a, if they are not humans, remember, they're just doing math back there. That's all they're doing. Um, all right. Um, yeah, but it's still feeding us questions, or are we pulling our own? Yeah. I just jumping uh, in here. I, th I think we have some more submitted questions. Um, here's a pretty good one that might be. Um, um, so the question is, I'm curious to hear about potential issues that might arise by encouraging staff to use AI tools such as generative AI, specifically ethical gray areas and guiding principles for staff. You want to take that first, Kim? You want me to grab that one? I, I mean, I can take the first jump. My first answer to that great question, thank you for asking it, whoever did. Um, again, this comes back to your AI policy, having a discussion, having what I think of as an intentional AI rollout. Um, and, and that means doing it with a sense of, you know, how do we want to train staff? What are we going to, what kind of guidance are we going to give people around what tools to use? What kind of use cases are okay? What kind are not? And giving people clear guidance is kind of the only way. It's the, it's the way to, I don't know if you said this already, Josh, but this is, this is a Joshism that you say very well, but it's a way to get the most benefit and mitigate risk all at the same time is having a clear set of guidance. Like we can't, stress that enough. And that is, as the title of this, ask the experts, right? That is the governance, right? And this is going to change. So prepare to kind of create a policy for your organization and a set of, you know, guiding principles that you may be adapting. So I don't, if you want to add to that. I think you covered it. I mean, I think we've, we've been talking a lot about that. I think some of it is is to me kind of easy, which is like, these are the tools we want you to use. Don't violate copyright. Um, understand that, you know, the data reflects existing biases in the data from the real world. So you have to allow for that and some basic training. I think where it gets complicated and, and more around the organization is really around the issue of transparency. So I think in many respects, the ethics are straightforward, not, not easy by any stretch, but they're, they're more obvious and straightforward to address. Transparency is trickier, which is if we use AI to create something, do we say that we used AI to create something? How do we say it helped? Do we say it completely made it? Um, and, and if we're using AI to make decisions, to write reports, are we doing that? So, you know, we have established a standard of roundtable that if we're using AI to produce stuff, we're going to say that AI was involved in the creation of this thing. We're going to be transparent about it at least that much to say we we did use AI for this. Um, I think that's something that is less clear as to what's the ethical right thing to do, but the organizations I think want to confront that and decide. 
Thanks. And I think along that vein, there was another another question um, regarding what is a way to ethically train AI that doesn't involve the unlawful use of people's creative works? Um, is art or writing generated using AI original work? I think that gets back to that earlier question around whether the, the large language models that you're using were trained ethically. Um, I think fortunately, the courts are going to make this better. And if systems are going to be trained on copyrighted data, then they will have to pay some sort of licensing fee to those copyright holders. The New York Times is quite famously suing OpenAI for quite a large sum of money right now. Um, and it, I think it will become financially untenable and legally untenable for these systems to just hoover up everything that is publicly available and say, well, it was publicly available so we can use it to train our models. I think that's, that's what happened <laughs> and it's unwinding now. Um, so I, I hope that answers the question, but right now, most of those systems were trained on copyrighted private information that just happened to be available uh, via the web and just got hoovered up. Yeah, I think I think that makes sense. I think it might be helpful for some organizations to know um, maybe what errors to look for and what what are the limitations there. One of the things I would certainly look at is that Unmasking AI book that Kim uh, dropped a link to. Um, I think that really addresses a lot of some of the real societal harms and things that can be done. I don't know if you want to talk about that, Kim, because I know you just finished that book recently. Yeah, I mean, it's not a perfect tool, right? I mean, here, here's the thing, here's the analogy that um, I'll, maybe I'm betraying my age, but probably not still. In this, uh, remember when the internet first made its appearance and there's a lot of like, oh God, there could be garbage out there or what's gonna happen with copyright? With, okay, this is, think of AI as a new new tool on that scale. So as with, the internet and some of the things we needed to learn about it were not are not that good. I'd be the first one to say, right? But it is a new kind of transformative way of working. And I think, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I'm answering this question, but I just think you need to think about it on those levels, right? And Kind of where is your organization's appetite? And really, do think internet in the in the 90s. It's 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 that much of a change. And so a lot of this is just new and is going to be sorted out. And you, you almost kind of need an ethicist of sorts for some of these kinds of questions. You know, for example, if I'm Things that clearly are unethical right now, right? If I go into an AI system and I say, write me something like Kurt Vonnegut or write me something like, you know, Dr. Joy Billamweenie, right? That's just unethical, right? I'm asking it to, to recreate the writing of a particular person who has copyright protection, right? If I say, you know, make me a painting that looks like this living artist's style, right? That's just really obvious. So that part's, I think, easy in terms of avoiding some of the ethics. I think where it gets harder, right? If I ask for an image of a group of um, South Asian children playing, right? I, I, do I have the ability to evaluate that photo and decide if it's really offensive, if it's, you know, doing stereotypes? It's like, there's a lot of challenges around that. Um, so it, <laughs> I keep saying some of it's easy. Some of it really is like, well, how do we deal with this as an organization? That's why you have to be using them and thinking about it, having these conversations. Yeah. Yes, because it's a group of nonprofits. I mean, Dr. Joy Boomwin, I realize I didn't answer that part of it. So she kind of she she tells the tale of the development of these tools. And while things have happened in like miracle time, right? The changes have been astronomical and expected to continue changing. She maintains, and I recommend this to anyone who's here who, who registered for, for this session, right? That Yes, there is a lot of built-in bias in our world's data. And the you know, we have to keep calling it out. The thing, the the good news, if you should call can call it that, is that there are groups that are dedicated to this. 
right? So there's the Algorithmic Justice League, which she founded. There's also um, someone, um, someone had asked a question here about how you can, um, about how are you, are you leaving? Okay. I gotta jump, Kim, um, but, but continue I, on. Oh, Thank I you leave, so much. It's three o'clock, my goodness, I'm so sorry. Um, anyway, someone asked like, you know, as nonprofits, how can we help? How, how can we help shape policy? Get to know some of these organizations that are working on policy. See what they're doing. Check out the Algorithmic Justice League. See how you can be involved. The more human-centered people that are doing this, the better we are as a world. So. Hello. Well said, Kim. Well said, Kim. Do you, do you guys want to stick around and ask more questions? Janet, I'm open to it. Whatever you guys want to do, Kim. I mean, I can answer a couple more questions if people have questions that they want to um, turn by. Or um, I think I dropped the sources that I wanted to share in here. Um, yeah, if anyone has a burning question, if not, continue to ask. We, you know, we can't, there's a lot that's still in the mix and, and, and being sorted out, right? A lot of these questions are on copyright. Goodness, around data privacy, it's going to be a lot of questions here, but, um, you know, be engaged in it and be engaged in the conversation. Um, these are largely not technology conversations, but questions around, again, asking questions, ethics, principles, those things. Well, again, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Microsoft, for this webinar today and our experts, Kim and Josh. Thank you so much. And thank you for attending. And we'll see you on the next one. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.